As most of you know, I'm David Cataforis, the uh, chair of the Art History Department, and um, I want to acknowledge that the University of Kansas resides on the ancestral territory of the Ka people, who were forced off their land by the United States in the 19th century and largely relocated to Oklahoma. This acknowledgement recognizes Native Americans as traditional guardians of the land and the enduring relationship between Native peoples and these traditional territories. I'm pleased to welcome you to this evening's Franklin D. Murphy Lecture by Dr. Alfreda Merck. This is the second of Dr. Merck's two Murphy Lectures. She delivered the first, Rethinking Woshi's Mountains Have Three Distances, in this room on February 11th. And that lecture is archived on the KU YouTube, uh, sorry, the KU Art History YouTube channel. Uh, this evening's lecture is also um, being streamed online, and I extend a warm welcome to those of you watching on the screen. Dr. Merck joins us both as the Franklin D. Murphy lecturer and the Franklin D. Murphy professor. During her residency, which was uh, in two separate weeks, she has co-taught in a seminar that Professor Amy McNair uh, is running for the whole semester on some era painting. Dr. Merck's public lectures are the latest in a series established in 1979 through the Kansas University Endowment Association in honor of former Chancellor Franklin D. Murphy, who led KU from 1951 to 1960. The Murphy Lectureship in Art brings distinguished art historians, critics, and artists to the University of Kansas, where they participate in the teaching of a graduate seminar in the Crest Foundation Department of Art History and deliver two public lectures. Normally, these lectures are delivered at the Spencer and the Nelson Atkins Museum of Art, but we've had to depart from that tradition during the pandemic as the Nelson has suspended public programming. But that means we get the pleasure of having Frida in this room twice. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Most of the lectures are subsequently developed into books published by the University of California Press in association with the Crest Foundation Department of Art History and the Spencer Museum of Art. And we look forward to the publication of Dr. Merck's book in that series. And now I'm pleased to welcome my colleague Amy McNair to the platform, and she will introduce Dr. Merck. Thank you, David. Thank you all for attending, and greetings to our online audience. I have the great pleasure of introducing Dr. Alfreda Merck, a specialist in the history of Chinese painting and poetry, for her second lecture as the 36th Franklin D. Murphy Lecturer. For many years, Dr. Merck was a curator in the Department of Asian Art at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York. And living in China from 1997 to 2013, she worked at the Beijing Palace Museum. She has taught at Beijing University and the Central Academy of Fine Arts. Most recently, she taught classes in Asian art at Columbia. Though Dr. Merck's Murphy lectures focus on Song Dynasty landscape painting and its literary and political implications, she has applied the same interdisciplinary approach to other genres, including images of plants, animals, and birds. In her recent article, Paintings of Stem Lettuce, Cabbage, and Weeds, <laughs> Illusions to Dufu's Garden, she analyzes how pictures of vegetables could, quote, convey Confucian rectitude and a sense of moral outrage. <laughs> While in another article, Magpies and Hair, Suebai's commentary on marriage, eunuchs, and self-awareness, she argues for a novel interpretation of this famous picture of a rabbit accosted by some raucous birds as a scene of court intrigue. The Murphy seminar that she and I have truly enjoyed teaching this semester is Song Era Painting, China and Beyond, in which the students have developed research projects under Dr. Merck's direction, encompassing Chinese, Japanese and Korean painting. The students and I have so much enjoyed learning from her and spending time with her. Tonight, she will introduce all of us to her latest research. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Alfreda Merck. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, Dr. McNair, for that wonderful introduction. Um, thank you, and uh, Professor Cataforis for the invitation to serve as the Franklin D. Murphy Lecturer. I'm deeply honored. It's really been such fun, really interesting. Um, the art history department and the graduate students could not have been more welcoming. 
Um, I have uh, really enjoyed every encounter with um, the people here. Um, I'm also, so I'm, uh, thank you for the thoughtful arrangements. I'm also indebted to the Nelson Atkins Gallery, um, which co-sponsors this lecture, and in whose collection is the painting that we are now considering. Well, thank you all for coming, and um, both in person and virtually. Um, so this, the Chao Jung Chong painting is a hand scroll, which is fascinating and really a unique work of art. Um, it has generated a large literature. I'm grateful for the insights of many scholars of art history and literature who have written about the scroll um, and the ode that it illustrates. So the Chao Jung Chong painting is an early example of scholar ink painting. This extraordinary masterpiece stands alone. It was painted around 1120, give or take a few years, uh, to illustrate a text that was written about four decades earlier in 1082 by the polymath Su Shi. Su Shi famously declared that painting is like poetry and poetry is like painting. But just how could a painting be like poetry? If you were a painter, how would you make your painting a poem into a poem? How would you make your painting poetic? So the illustration of the latter ode of the Red Cliff is a case study of how an artist incorporated literary metaphors and allusions into a landscape painting. We know that from the earliest history, Chinese poets used observations of nature to comment on the human condition, to describe life, love, human relationships, decline and death. Poets found useful analogies in the cycle of the four seasons, in the behavior of birds and animals, and in the flourishing and withering of plants. Depending on what a poet wanted to express, literary metaphors could be obvious or extremely obscure. Auspicious subjects such as peony blossoms as an image of wealth and ripe peaches as a symbol of longevity were widely recognized. Auspicious images reinforced the court's vision of a country at peace and people living in harmony. Regrettably, life in the Northern Song was far from harmonious. There were floods and famines. There were costly border wars with the Kitan Liao and the Tan Gut Xi Xia. If a poet wanted to express frustration at bad imperial policy, he had to be careful and choose less obvious metaphors and allegories. If you got into trouble for uh, writing poetry, you could express your thoughts in painting. What came to be called silent poetry? Uh, the obscure metaphors and illusions that criticize are often ambiguous. When metaphors based on the natural world are painted, they blend into the landscape. We'll see that in a moment, but first I want to introduce the key persona, the poet, the patron, and the painter. So Su Shi was born into a well-to-do intellectual family in Meishan, southwest of Chengdu in Sichuan province. Now remember that Sichuan's climate, dialect, customs were different from those of the more formal uh, protocols in Kaifeng, the capital. Under Emperor Renzong, Su Shi took and passed the imperial triennial examination with high honors. In 1061, Su Shi was invited to take a special imperial decree examination. Again, he passed with high honors. The theme was frank and direct criticism, which he took very seriously through his official career. Um, speaking truth to power repeatedly got him into trouble. In 1078, a message, uh, Su Shi sent a message to Emperor Shenzong opposing, he was out of the capital, but he sent it via a friend, opposing preparations for war and warning that court officials were stirring up trouble on the northern border. Su Shi was not actually opposed to military um, action, but he felt it should be used for defense, uh, to defend the Song Dynasty borders, uh, not for invading a neighboring country. The following year, Su Shi was arrested um, for his objections to imperial policies. At his trial, later called the Crow Terrace Poetry Trial, the focus was on satirical poems that 
mocked imperial policy that Suchet had written many years before. It may have been his opposition to the preparations for war that got him into the most trouble that triggered this, we don't know. He was uh, convicted of great irreverence to the emperor, a capital offense. But instead of execution, he was banished to Huangzhou, a small town on the Yangtze River. A condition of exile was to cease commenting on government affairs. That was hard for Su Shur to do, but news from the capital reached Su Shur through friends who sent messengers or who visited personally. It was in exile at Huangzhou that Su Shur wrote the two odes, also called prose poems, uh, on the Red Cliff. I agree with those scholars who suspect that he was commenting on military affairs. Now, Liang Shicheng was a powerful imperial eunuch who served at the court of Huizong. Huizong was the emperor who reigned in the first quarter of the 12th century. Uh, Huizong had a high regard for Liang Shicheng. Uh, he appointed him the head of the imperial scriptorium and later put him in charge of the palace library, which cataloged and stored calligraphy, paintings, and books. Huizong even awarded Liang an honorary ginger degree, the highest civil service degree. Liang Shicheng claimed to be the illegitimate son of Su Shi. Uh, when Emperor Huizong declared Su Shi an enemy of the state, Liang Shicheng famously asked at court, what crime has my father committed? <laughs> While Emperor Huizong made it illegal to own Su Shi's writing, Liang was spending large sums of money to purchase Su Shi's calligraphy. Professor Lei Xue has made a good argument for Liang Shicheng being the patron of the Chao Zheng Chang painting. Nine of Liang's seals, this is from uh, uh, Xue Cheng's uh, article, Lei Xue's article, sorry. Um, so the, the nine seals are on the paper joins. Um, the landscape is a continuous painting on eight sheets of paper, but it's artfully divided uh, by passages of water and rocky bluffs. And as you can see, I think uh, the text of Sucher's Ode, divided into nine passages, is inscribed on the painting. Which brings us to the painter. There is no signature on the painting. The name Zhong Chang appears in a colophon which is now lost that was recorded in an 18th century imperial catalog. A brief biography of the painter says that he studied Li Gong Lin. It's not clear whether he studied with Li Gong Lin or just studied Li Gong Lin's paintings. What is clear is that this is the work of a mature, sophisticated artist who painted in an elegant monochrome style that was closely associated with the scholar Su Shi and even more closely with Su Shi. Um, this superb painting with its dazzling brushwork is the only surviving work attributed to Chao Zheng Chang. Although the attribution is tentative, the name is verbally associated with the scroll, so for convenience I will call I will use Chao Zheng Chang as the painter. Now, <laughs> before we get to the painting, a word about the historical background of Su Shi's two odes. Since taking the throne in 1068, Emperor Shenzong had imperialist ambitions to reclaim territories beyond the Song Dynasty's northern border. These territories had previously belonged to the Tang Dynasty, from which the Song Dynasty claimed descent, uh, but for over a century they were parts of the Xia and Liao kingdoms. Years of preparation culminated in Song Dynasty army, armies making five-pronged attack on the Xia neighbor in the autumn of 1081. After initial success, Song Dynasty success, the Tanguts regrouped and inflicted a series of devastating defeats on the Song armies. Despite that disaster, the following year in 1082, some ministers advocated new assaults against the Tanguts. Su Shi's first ode on the Red Cliff was written in the seventh month of 1082. This is thought to be, an, this is definitely an illustration of the Red Cliff uh, attributed to Wu Yuanzhi, now in the uh, Palace Museum in Taipei. It is understood, the first ode is understood as a meditation 
on the continuity of existence and finding joy in what is available to everyone, the bright moon, pure breeze. At the same time, Suchere may have been responding to the military losses of the previous year. He was that clever a poet. He could do these things simultaneously. Um, uh, and was warning against a second invasion. Remember the line that is in the poem, moreover, everything in the world has its owner. And if a thing doesn't belong to us, we don't dare take a hair of it. For the next attack on the Tanguts, Emperor Shenzong appointed a pompous official who claimed that he, unlike the cowardly generals of 1081, could easily defeat the Tanguts. In the field, he unwisely made his base at Yongle, the site of a previous military disaster. Yongle had no independent water supply and was basically indefensible. After a series of foolish decisions by the Song Chinese official, in the ninth lunar month of 1082, the Tanguts massacred the entire Song army. In the following month, reports of the massacre reached Su Shur, and that's when he composed the second ode, which is darker and more unsettling. Between 1081 and 1082, an estimated 200,000 troops and officers were um, died in these battles. And the economies of both countries were terribly disrupted. From the title of the odes, the reader is alerted to Suchere's interest in warfare. The title refers to the most famous battle of Chinese history. In 208 CE, a large powerful army suffered a calamitous defeat at the hands of a weaker foe. The location of the Red Cliff Battle was about 50 miles upstream from Su Xu's exile at Huangzhou, and he was aware of that geography. Um, there's a little hill at Huangzhou that is named the Huangzhou Red Cliff. I suspect it was after Su Xu wrote these odes that it got that name. Um, so. Among the many possible references to military conflict in the ode and the painting, I will try to explain five images that resonate with the literary tradition and with Suchere's own writing. And you see them here, a leafless tree, the shadows of men, a tethered horse and sleeping groom, rocks emerging from receding water, water flowing over rocks. I'm proposing that Chao Jung Chang's painting reinforces the possibility that Su Xu was commenting on the inept conduct of war. Three of the visualized metaphors can be seen in paintings in later centuries. So Su Xu began the second ode as a con continuation of the first with a specific time and place. He wrote, this same year, 1082, on the 15th day of the 10th month, I was walking back from Snow Hall to my home at Lin Gao, uh, at Lin Gao. The 15th is one day past the full moon. The specificity of time and place suggests that the ode is a record of the event that evening. The readers asked to believe that Su Xu was writing down what transpired with his friends. Some scholars, however, doubt that he even went out on the river that he perhaps uh, was boating only in his imagination at his desk. I think people who have memorized this poem in high school will not accept that idea, but <laughs> it's so appealing that he was out on the river. Okay, the painting originally began with a depiction of Snow Hall. Suchere built Snow Hall in early 1082 to have some space away from his large family. The family uh, plus the servants numbered over 20 um, at the government post house at Lingao. The second, uh, the section of paper with the depiction of Snow Hall is lost, but uh, Professor Itakura published this Kano copy that's in Kyoto. Um, uh, so the red pieces, the red outline shows what is lost. Um, the Kano copy is a copy of a copy. 
because the original painting stayed in China, uh, has imperial seals and was cataloged in uh, the 18th century. Um, so the blue outline shows the first sheet of paper and there's a little bit that still survives. Um, Snow Hall was so, so a place to receive visitors and to practice Buddhist meditation. So you can see behind the hall at the front, uh, there is a covered corridor and then uh, a Buddhist meditation hall. So following his near execution in 1079, Sushir became a very serious Buddhist and he urged friends to eat vegetarian and was very proud when he convinced someone, mentions it now and then. So the prose poem continues, two friends were with me and we went by way of yellow mud slope. Frost had already fallen and the trees were bare of leaves. Chao Zheng Chang has given the bare trees dramatic prominence. This is our first example of an image alluding to specific literary content blended into the landscape. Well, you say it's early winter and Sushir, after all, has mentioned leafless trees. However, elsewhere in the scroll, trees are depicted with lots of leaves. The starkness of the bare trees seems to be an intentional statement. I discussed the tree, uh, the leaf falling metaphor in the last lecture. To briefly summarize, the Han Dynasty scholar Wang Yi originated the idea that falling leaves could be equated with careers damaged and lives lost. His commentary on the Ladies of the Xiang in the anthology Songs of Chu says the following. It says that because the autumn winds were strong and grasses and trees are shaking, the Xiang River has waves and tr leaves, tree leaves are falling. This is to say great men govern anxiously and the people worry. What is more, worthy men have been injured. Others say that it means that Chu Yuan saw the autumn wind rising and tree leaves falling, and grieved that the year was advancing to its end and that he was getting old. <laughs> Chu Yen, of course, is the archetype of the unjust, um, unjustly maligned loyal official. Over the centuries, unhappy or exiled officials amplified Wang Yi's interpretation, such that in the eighth century, a commentary of the Wenxuan, where the uh, poems were collected, commissioned by Emperor Minghuang, flatly states, this is a metaphor for petty-minded bureaucrats seizing authority and fine men being cast aside. Now, to allude to this tradition of commentary, an artist had two options. He could paint leaves in the act of falling or paint bare, bare branches. So these are two Southern Sung images of um, the, lady of the, the Lady of the Shang or the Ladies of the Shang that gets changed, uh, Never mind. Southern Sung illustrations of the Ladies of the Shang show both uh, treatments. In the 19th and 20th centuries, painters drew on the same critical meaning that was tucked in the less read commentary. Ren Xiong, Fu Bao Shi, and Zhang Daqian all painted the Lady of the Xiang with leaves cascading down. Now, immediately following, following the image of the leafless trees is an equally provocative image, the rare indication of shadows of four human figures on, on the ground. Why are shadows so rarely painted? They're not difficult to paint. Indeed, these shadows cast by the moon are just a few brushstrokes of light wash. The poem includes the line indicating that people's shadows are on the ground, okay? But although it is a bright moonlight, moonlit night, Chao Zheng Tong does not indicate shadows cast by other figures. The avoidance of painting shadows is likely because they suggest ghosts. The, in the 4th century BCE philosopher Xunzi told the story of a gullible man who mistook his shadow for a crouching ghost. He tries to run away, but it follows him. Terrified, he runs faster and faster, but the ghost keeps up with him. 
he finally reaches home where he collapses of exhaustion and dies. <laughs> a similar story of mistaking a shadow for a ghost appears in the Taoist classic Zhuangzi. In both cases, the authors ridicule the naivete of the victim, but the association of shadows and ghosts persisted. The character for shadow, Ying, that you see there, um, was used in the Northern Song for the hall in which portraits of ancestors were hung. The shadow hall, the Ying Tang, was used for family ancestral rituals, suggesting that this connection between deceased people and shadows was current at the time that Su Shi was writing. Remember, it was believed that the dead who did not get a satisfactory burial were likely to be unhappy ghosts, hungry ghosts that wandered about. If Su Shi was responding to news of a devastating military loss, his simple four characters suggest that he was noting that possibly many dead were lying unburied on battlefields and possibly wandering. Uh, Susher and companions sing songs to each other, and he regrets that they have this beautiful evening, but no food or wine. One of the guests says that he has caught a fine fish. They cross a bridge and reach Lingao. This is the government post house. You see it at the left there, uh, where Su's large family was living. Happily, his wife provides a jug of wine that she has been saving for such an occasion. The painter has given this passage wonderful details. There is the mysterious figure at the gate whose face is largely hidden. Could it be that the painter is including himself in the scene? That sometimes happened. He seems to have lost one shoe. If you have any ideas about a lost shoe <laughs> and its significance, let me know. There is Susher carrying the fish and the jug of wine. Oh, by the way, these depictions of Susher in this scroll are the earliest surviving portraits of Susher and by a painter who possibly knew him. So we should take them seriously as possible representations of Susher. Uh, he glances over his shoulder at his wife who stands in the doorway. The maid servant with her holds a lighted candle. Now the candle is not in the prose poem, but it does remind us that the scene is unfolding at night. This is a convention scene in a number of nighttime scenes. Uh, in the ode, the gentlemen immediately take the wine and fish and go for another boat ride on the river. But Chao Zheng Chang has added an intriguing detail that is not in the ode. It is the horse in cross ties and the sleeping groom by the side of the house. Why add this? Is it just a charming genre detail? Uh, maybe the sleeping groom is another reminder of nighttime. But when we look closely, we see that the horse is rather tightly secured to two posts. Usually cross ties are used when you're grooming the horse and not for a long period of time. Uh, but the Groom has gone to sleep and left the horse standing there. Uh, behind the sleeping groom, there appears to be a bag of feed and a jar of water, but the trough is empty. Does this vignette hint at something about Sushir? Well, soon after he returned to court in 1086, so after his exile in Huangzhou, but before this painting was done, Su Shi discovered that fine tribute horses were no longer being received, and those horses that were in the imperial stables were being neglected. Susher wrote that the handsome horses were eight feet tall. It's a large horse. <laughs> they had dragon-like foreheads and phoenix-like chests. Their coats had spots that recalled leopards. So I want to remind you that horses were also equated with human talent. So when Susher write, is writing, he's writing about horses, but it's easy to suspect that he had himself and other officials in mind when he wrote the following. Okay, he says, when they arrived at the capital, they were spirited, shaking their manes and calling to each other, neighing. After being kept in the imperial stables without care, all of the horses became mute. 
the four characters that you see there became a set phrase for the people falling silent, a set phrase for political oppression. So the lack of daily care led to some horses dying, but even then, Sue writes, the court failed to investigate. He concludes, the country was then at peace, but because tribute horses were no longer being accepted, the people were less safe. He asked Lee Gung Lin to paint three of the horses in the stables. That painting, unfortunately, doesn't survive. Robert Harris, Jonathan Hay, and others have called attention to the imperial stables as a symbol of China's military power. The Tan Gut Shisha and the Kitan Liao were superior in breeding and riding horses, which gave them a tactical advantage over the Song armies. Horses were critical to national defense. Chao Zheng Chang's horse resembles a horse in Li Gonglin's long hand scroll pasturing horses. Here, a small detail. But whereas Li Gonglin, I mean, there's close to a thousand horses in that scroll. But whereas Li Gonglin's horses were romping and eating grass, the cross ties on Chao's horse are so short that it could not lower its head to eat a bit of straw, let alone reach the food trough, which is empty anyway. Um, <coughs> it's possible that the painter and patron incorporated this detail of a tethered horse and sleeping groom to remember Sushir's concern for the forgotten horse, to remember the lack of military preparedness, and to comment silently on the problem of people falling silent, the court not listening to people. Behind Lin Gao, we see a second instance of bare trees possibly a reference to the season, these trees, and maybe an implication that here lives someone whose career has been compromised. The Lin Gao compound is separated from the next scene by a striking steep embankment of boulders confidently brushed in fluid strokes. On the far side, we find Su Shi and his companions seated on the riverbank drinking from antique wine cups. Sushir is handsome and noticeably larger, more important than his guests. But they, oh, sorry. In front of them are nine rocks emerging from the river. The ode reads, the water had receded and rocks became visible. This observation that when water goes down, now, rocks emerge could apply to any water course, but in the 11th century, the observation was most often said of a moraine in the upper Yangtze River. And so I believe this could be a reference to the eight formation diagram of the brilliant military strategi strategist Zhuge Liang. Okay, this, it's a leap, but let me explain. Mm -hmm. At the beginning of the third century CE, Warlords of three kingdoms, the Wei, Shu, and Wu, were competing to unify China. Enlisted by Liu Bei, Zhuge Liang collaborated with Zhou Yu in the famous Battle of the Red Cliff, previously mentioned. They used fire to defeat the stronger opponents, Hao Cao. Here in an illustration of the incident as recounted and embellished in the Romance of the Three Kingdoms, Zhuge Liang is at the right in bare feet with hair let down. He brandishes a sword. He is chanting a Taoist charm to increase the wind velocity. He was successful. Their flaming boats, here shown as flamethrowers, crashed into Cao Cao's superior fleet and Cao Cao's navy was decimated. Now, part of Zhuge Liang's legendary brilliance at strategy revolves around the eight battle formation or eight formation diagram, the Ba Jun Tu. It is mentioned in passing in his official biography of one of his brilliant developments, but they don't explain it. No description is given. More than a century later, more than a century after Zhuge Liang's death, the Eastern Jin general Huan Wen was traveling up the Yangtze River and he saw some 60 boulders in the shallows near the Three Gorges. 
Because they were smooth and evenly spaced, the boulders begged for an explanation of human intervention. How could it just happen that they were there? Then? Juan Juan said, ah, I've got it. This is Zhuge Liang's eight formation diagram. He and his troops organized this. So what did this geological rarity actually look like? The boulders were, sorry, the boulders were probably a moraine left behind by a receding glacier. At the lower left, you see a moraine um, near Boomerang Range in Antarctica. Uh, the moraine thought to be Zhuge Liang's eight formation diagram was at a bend in the Yangtze River called Fish Return in between Kweifu and White Emperor City uh, on, the north bank, on the north bank. So it is now, by the uh, early 20th century, it was already filled in with earth and became came farmland, and now it's completely inundated uh, because of the Three Gorges Dam. Now, the great Tang Dynasty poet Du Fu lived in Kweifu for several years near the Eight Formation Diagram. He visited temples to Zhuge Liang and celebrated the rock formation as a feature of Kweifu. He wrote, Battle Formation in Sand Along the North Bank market end near the islets, inlet's west peak. In a poem titled Eight Formation Diagram, it's hard to see, but there they are. Can you see? This is a, a scroll in the Fear Gallery. So in his poem, Eight Formation Diagram, Dufu wrote, his deeds covered a kingdom split in three. His fame completed the Eight Formation Diagram. The river flows, the rocks do not turn. Remnant bitterness at failure to swallow Wu. Dufu highlights this feature of the battle formations that many authors remark on. The river beats on them, but when the level water level falls, they're still there. They haven't moved. So this Dufu poem, interestingly, features in Sushir's account of a dream that is relevant to his attitude about war. In Sushir's dream, he meets Dufu. Dufu complains that people misunderstand this poem. Sushir wrote, I often meet people in dreams. For example, Dufu once said to me, most people under misunderstand my poem, Eight Formation Diagram. The poem says the river flows, the rocks do not turn, eternal regret for failing to swallow Wu. People all assume that Liu Bei and Zhu Liang wanted like Guan Yu, to take revenge, and that the poem expresses regret at not being able to destroy Wu. Not so. My meaning was that Wu and Shu were countries as close as teeth and lips. That's hard to paint. That's a metaphor that should best <laughs> leave, leave alone. Countries should not plot against each other. The reason that Jin was able to subdue Shu was because Shu was thinking about taking Wu. This is annoying. <laughs> Sushir concludes, this experience was truly profound. Du Fu has been dead for four, nearly 400 years, but because I cannot forget the poem's minutia, I naturally distinguish his meaning. This is the unhealthy habit of a bookish student, he says. <laughs> So Sushir was appropriating Du Fu's voice to make the point that neighboring states should not scheme e against each other, but should find a way to peacefully coexist. For Du Fu, the eight formation oh, this, okay. For Du Fu, the eight the boulders of the eight formation diagram were more than an emblem of Zhuge Liang and his badly needed military expertise. Zhuge Liang also represented someone who was recruited by the ruler to help save the country and who served his sovereign loyally. In a poem on visiting a temple to Zhuge Liang, Du Fu idealized the relationship between sovereign and minister. Ruler and subject then worked together a worthy man and sage living at the same time. Zhuge Liang and Liu Bei, of course, did not succeed 
in United the Country. It was a failure. But du it's with Dufu that the rehabilitation begins. Um, and as you saw earlier, Zhuge Liang is so glamorized now in video games and movies and so on. Um, he's become a real popular hero. Now, as you'll recall, Su Xiu and Su Zhe, uh, the brothers, uh, had been raised in Sichuan. When traveling to the capital um, and back home, they passed the site of these often submerged rocks that were supposedly arranged by Zhuge Liang, and they visited a temple to Zhuge Liang. On one occasion, they scrambled up a hill. Here's another representation of the stones um, on the opposite bank to look down on the array of stones. They both wrote poems commemorating the experience. In Su Xiu's hyperbolic description, the formation stretched for a thousand feet, and Su Zhe wrote, the river at flood beats upon the eight formations. When the river recedes, the formations are as before. They both mention that there are 64 rocks in all. That number, of course, has auspicious Taoist connotations, eight by eight. Um, other authors mention that the eight formations are like a chessboard, which is what we see in this hand scroll, a second hand scroll in the fear um, on the Yangtze River, um, the 10,000 miles of the Yangtze River. Now, it is inconvenient to paint 64 little rocks, right? So Chao Zheng Chang has instead painted nine rocks. This is, and I think they're very purposefully painted. Um, this is an instance in Chinese numerology where numbers are fluid. Nine stones are a flexible reference to the eight formation diagram that are in fact more than eight, right? Other artists, um, who illustrated uh, the latter ode on the red cliff, follow the eight plus one formula. We see this in Lee Sung's brown fan, also in the Nelson Atkins collection. Count them. Aren't there nine stones there? And we know this is red cliff, probably same, same idea. Okay, uh, and it's worth noting that Shui Luo Shi Chu came to mean the truth will come out. So uh, this is another instance where Su Xiu formulates one of those tidy four character phrases that then uh, becomes part of the language. Now to move on to the fifth and final painted metaphor, uh, we must race past one of the most electrifying passages in the painting, uh, the grove of trees with unusual rocks, where Su Xiu picks up his robe and climbs up the hill. So he's a little bit hard to pick out but he's right here. So Sue has a terrifying experience at the top of the mountain. He whistles, the landscape responds, the wind arises and the water churns. Frightened, Sushir descends the mountain and returns to his friends. The beautiful passage of, gro of a grove of diverse trees, <laughs> trees are also people, uh, suggest a variety of personalities. Uh, so you can see the trees on the left of this detail. And the shortest inscription from the poem is written between these two tree trunks, three characters, crouching tiger and leopard. This scene in the, in the painting is a departure from the poem. Most unexpected is the array of four very distinctive rocks in the foreground. Rocks also suggestive of personalities. Okay, so we conclude now with a supremely ambiguous image, water flowing over rocks as a symbol of grief. Now, I could hear you saying, this is a river, there are rocks. Water does flow in rivers, okay. Indeed. Water flowing over rocks is so common in Chinese painting that it's hard to tell when it might have special significance. So the question is, was Chao Zheng Chang and his patron, uh, Liang Shi Cheng, including a reference to Chan Yuan? It has two definitions, two dictionary definitions. One is water flowing over rocks. The second is sobbing, tears streaming down cheeks. 
Chan Yuan does not, I use the Chinese because I can't say all of that on one. Chan Yuan does not appear in any of the Confucian classics, including the Book of Songs, the Book of Poetry. It is a southern term that features in the anthology Songs of Chu. These two characters are not in Su Shi's Ode, but an image of, flowing over, of water flowing over rocks is in the painting. Again, you say, okay, this is natural. Uh, but if one thinks of tears falling, one can read the image as mourning for soldiers killed in battle and also for Su Shi. Now, just after Su Shi died, Huang Tingjian sent a poem uh, called Wind in the Pines Pavilion, itself a reference to Su Shi, to Zhang Lei, another devoted follower of Su Shi. Huang Tingjian wrote that a dry spring once again had water flowing over rocks, and there are other references to, to Su Shi in the poem. Um, so in this context, Zhang Lei would ha immediately have understood, yes, we're again grieving for our mentor Su Shi. Huang Tingchen's poem is so beautiful, uh, and the calligraphy is so wonderful, um, was terribly important because he is bringing together grief, sobbing, and water flowing, which means hereafter you have a way to paint grief. So, if one thinks, um, so anyway, an opportunity to paint grief through this reference. Uh, the painting concludes with an illustration of a single crane flying over the boat. The friends end their outing and return home to sleep. Susher has a dream of a conversation with two Taoists. He awakens with a start, rushes to the gate, to see them, but they have vanished. Here he is at the gate, and none, they are nowhere to be seen. I'm not going to try to explain the one crane to Taoists, but I think it was intentional. Uh, in some later editions, it's cleaned up, so it's one Taoist, one crane, one Taoist. Um, in the years immediately preceding Chao Zheng Chang's illustration of Su Shi's Ladder Ode, so we're talking around 1120, perhaps three years earlier, three years, two years after. The allusion to mourning was unfortunately again appropriate. From 1115 to 1119, there was another attempt to recover territory from northern neighbors. The conflict went on for four years and led to even greater losses than the battles of 1081 and 1082. This made Su Shi's critique of an earlier military disaster newly germane. These are the five metaphors and illusions that I've identified. Taken together, uh, it is reasonable to conclude that Liang Shicheng and uh, Chao Zhongchang shared Su Shi's anxiety over adventurous wars and the need for wiser military strategy. So I've given you the pithy um, nexus, the little message that these images might convey. The iconography of Chinese landscape painting, at least from the 11th century, was richly complicated by the inclusion of paintable literary metaphors. The metaphors and allegories based on the natural world virtually disappear in landscape paintings. Ambiguity is an inherent feature of this kind of landscape painting. So how we read the images largely depends on context. Three of the metaphors given visual form in this painting were used in later landscapes. So the leaves falling, uh, not the shadows of men, that never gets painted again as far as I know, and uh, not the tethered horse, but water level receding and rocks emerging, yes, you can find nine rocks. And water flowing over stones, tears down cheeks, yes. Um, so these metaphors and allegories 
suggests that Chao Zhengcheng and his patron were eager to remember Su Shi's opposition to an unnecessary war and to commemorate his concern for the state and its people. Now, in closing, I want to recall the spirit of John Crawford, John M. Crawford, Jr., the collector who assembled wonderful Chinese paintings and calligraphy, uh, including this latter ode on the Red Cliff. He generously shared his collection with graduate students and visiting scholars. I was privileged to have the opportunity to view the Chao Jung Tong scroll at his home on 82nd Street, just a block and a half from the Metropolitan Museum. Um, <laughs> most of John Crawford's large collection went to the Metropolitan Museum, but he gave Mark Wilson his choice of a piece for the Nelson Atkins. Mark wisely chose the latter ode on the Red Cliff. The passage of time has validated that choice. The more we study Chao Jung Chong's evocative, evocative hand scroll, the more interesting and historically important it becomes. So thank you very much. <laughs>
I'm wondering about the shadows of men imagery and its wider use in Sushur's poetry. In particular, the image of Su dancing with his shadow in Shui Diao Gu, is that connected to the imagery in this scroll? You know, I thought about that, and there is, uh, I think you can use shadows as Li Bo did, dancing with his shadow, um, without referring to ghosts, because they're not, they're not frightened by the shadow, they're engaging the shadow as a partner in the dance. So I think it's okay, but then it doesn't get painted. But if anyone knows of later painting, please let me know, because I've searched books and haven't found it, but it could be out there. I'm going to ask another one from the chat. Rachel Quist writes, thank you so much for your fascinating and engaging lecture, Professor Merck. I wondered if you could speak a bit more about the phenomenon of authors identifying themselves or their colleagues with horses or other animals. Was this common? And was there any potential that someone might be offended by the comparison? I have seen, she says parenthetically, I have seen paintings and calligraphy that likened rocks, bamboo, or other natural features to human subjects, but I was surprised by the horse allusion. There is extensive comparison of people and horses. Um, and uh, Li Gonglin's Five Horses that recently, two years ago, appeared in Tokyo and is now at the Tokyo National Museum, has lots of colophons that have those associations. Uh, but it goes back much further to Bo Le, to the, the, um, uh, the man who was felt to be incredibly intuitive in judging horses. And so there, there are early texts that mention uh, the comparison of people and horses. And uh, in the Yuan Dynasty, at the end of the Song Dynasty and beginning of the, there are a couple paintings attributed to Zhao Mengfu, not entirely sure if they are, but they um, very clearly show a very sad horse, very skinny and and uncared for. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think there definitely it's in poetry as well. Even Du Fu writes about encountering a, po a, a horse that is emaciated and it still has it in, its imperial uh, um, regalia on. Um, and the implication is, I mean, they always go from whether it's vegetables or a tree, it, to their own situation. So it, it's definitely there. And I would re refer you to uh, Bob Harris catalog at uh, China Institute um, just on horses. Um, it was, what, maybe 20 years ago, but very, still very useful. Imagine the Sushu's attitude towards the, you know, the war against the neighboring you know, regimes. Uh, I wonder, you, know, you also mentioned that at the time of Chao Zhong Chang, the Song also suffered from like, a miserable loss on the war in the borderland. So I wonder whether you know, by doing, by elevating, trying to elevate Sushu in his painting, does Chao Zhong Chang has anything or any statement behind that about the military you know, attitude of the current regime? I think very possibly, oh, I mean, of course, one has to speculate on that, but it seems like it fits pretty well. And I think, uh, I don't know, perhaps Professor McNair has an idea about Liang Shicheng's attitude towards uh, the wars that were being conductive, conducted at that point. You know, yeah. I, I really don't know what he thought about that. He was so busy building his own empire of documents and writing and stuff, but he, um, and he did have uh, honorary military titles, but he was never a military person. So I, he, I have no recorded impression of what he thought about that. I imagine he just thought it was not his world. Yeah. One of the really unfortunate things is that we know so little about Chao Jung Chang. It's, it's really tragic because this is such a masterpiece. And uh, so you just, 
weep for not having other, other possible paintings by him. I mean, it's just a spectacular painting. So, um, but we're glad that it survives, right? <laughs> Logan, oh, so, yes, Logan. Yes. Yeah. Um, I have two questions, but I would like to ask them separately because they're not really related. The first thing is that um, one of the things that struck me about this as a hand scroll, particularly, um, is how it's so obviously different scenes. Um, usually when you look at such a, such a long artwork, you expect to really flow with it and follow it. But like, for example, even in, in this example, uh, in this in these two scenes, if you will, you have this uh, forward look, you know, this face perspective from the house. And then in the, the next scene, you're looking at the house as it's pointing east or something. And then there are even points where Sushur is actually kind of looking towards the previous scene as well. I was wondering if you could talk about the directional composition um, and how that kind of relates to the narrative, if at all of the Red Cliff, or if that's a, um, or if I'm mistaken in, in thinking that this kind of thing is, no, is, is unusual, any thoughts on that? You, in truth, I haven't thought about that. Um, I just sort of accept his mm -hmm. visual narrative um, and the artfulness of uh, dividing the spaces. Um, it's presumably around the place where Sushir lived at Lingao, um, near Huangzhou. It was outside the city wall, but um, I don't, I'll have to think about that further. I mean, he does uh, change the orientation. Zhao Yi? For the case of Sushi, the music director of Sushi, just mentioned by uh, Logan, I don't have a thing. So, you know, I think in the poem, Sushi first go to the Red Cliff, and because he said there's no, you know, fish and no alcohol, he went back to his house. And then go again, you know, go to that tree to climb the mountain. So I guess, you know, there is some like, interaction between the location and indicating his like moving trajectory or something like that. Yes, and, right. Like, so it's. Return, yeah, right? yeah, there's there's definitely, I mean, you just, I think you have to just go with the flow and to follow Sushir up the mountain and not worry about it too much. <laughs> <laughs> What's your second question? Uh, so my second So I'm wondering actually about the sequence of how these motifs appear um, within the hand scroll as well. As you have these five different ones, but they do appear, you, they appear in a certain sequence. Um, is, that, is that representative or of, the, of the literature itself, of the, of the ode? Or is that something that's separate? Is there a reason for the sequence of going from the falling leaves to the next thing, the next thing, the next thing, as you're, as you're talking about. Well, so it's simply the sequence in the ode itself. Okay. The leaves are falling, and then he immediately says, shadows are on the ground. I think that juxtaposition is significant. Mm -hmm. okay. um, and then, actually, it's, it's quite fun because there's a sense of uh, liveliness and that they really are enjoying the evening. And I think that's absolutely typical of Sushir, that he could um, draw us into this event with uh, a sense of, oh, uh, you know, he does go up the mountain and it's frightening and exciting. But uh, you just go along with this wonderful narrative of the events. So if you read it, with those, the, that double uh, sense that, okay, there's this wonderful flow of ev events, but he's also talking about uh, warfare or objecting to, then it, it has a more complicated, uh, but um, I think it's not so puzzling um, uh, sequence. So anyway. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yes. Sushir, and um, <laughs> is there a consensus among scholars who study uh, this period that 
Regrettably, there is no DNA <laughs> <laughs> source. <laughs> um, so, uh, Professor McNair has written about eunuchs having their biological father, and then they have an adopted father, and then they have a spiritual father. So, sometimes they just adopt some great man as their um, spiritual father. But Liang Shicheng actually said that Su Shi was his biological father. Of a, with a singing girl? What was it? Mm -hmm. Did he? Mm -hmm. So we don't know. I have one more here. Uh, Francesca Leifer, thank you so much for your insightful lecture, Professor Merck. The text in the painting, uh, this is somebody after my own heart, the text in the painting is split into passages of different lengths and inscribed on the painting itself. How do you think this affects the viewer's experience of the painting? and perhaps their understanding of the literary metaphors you referred to? Could you please comment more on this? Thank you for that question. I think it does, of course, um, influence how you look at the painting. This is actually at a moment when the um, latter ode of the Red Cliff is still fairly new. And so to have the text there is very it's actually very helpful today, too. <laughs> um, but the, to have the literary metaphors there just lays it right out. Um, so I think it's definitely helpful. And it's divided into unequal sections, but, um, and that, I'm, some people have worked on that, and I think uh, it deserves more work as I look at a book manuscript about this. <laughs> All right, we have, uh, let's just do one more, okay? Okay. And we'll let you mm -hmm. have it, uh, your well earned um, uh, rest. Okay, Reggie Lowe writes, and here, this is Marcia's, Marcia's contribution. You're out there, Marcia. The horse's head is fastened with two strings on two poles or pillars. Was this a usual way to keep the horse to stay in one place? <laughs> or was this a special method only depicted? Uh, here in the hand scroll. Does it allude to anything? Thank you. Okay, so thank you. Uh, yes, it is to keep the horse still, um, and it's still used today. It's very common that you tie the horse, but usually they are a little bit longer and they drape down, and sometimes the horse has a bag of feed hanging from his head, so he has something to eat. Um, it, I'm told by Marcia, <laughs> thank you, that uh, it generally wasn't done overnight, that you just uh, have the horse in the cross ties, they're called cross ties, uh, for a short period of time, um, maybe half an hour, an hour, while you're grooming the horse, taking care of it. Yeah, so it's inappropriate that it be harnessed that way with the groom asleep because it's supposed to be merely temporary, right? Yes, yeah. right. Well, let's thank our guests. <laughs> thank you.